What is not easy is getting up and condensing down your life's work in two minutes, making sure that you tell people just enough to whet their appetite and give them a sense of your commitment and passion. And as I described to you before, it takes massive amounts of batteries, massive amounts of energy. And the idea of finding partners and finding people who are as committed as you are is one of, if not the most difficult job of entrepreneurs today. As I mentioned earlier, four years ago at Health Data Palooza, I got to meet Dr. Toby Cosgrove. Dr. Cosgrove blessed us with his incredible, generous wisdom and insights into what the entrepreneurs were embarking on. An incredible, an incredible task, but the most important task of their life. And as I described to you batteries included and what it sounds like, what it reads like, what is described like, there is nobody I can think could harness the energy of such a massive organization and be himself, batteries included, energy providing, partners to us at Startup Health, the entrepreneurs in our global army. As I mentioned, this is our fourth straight year in a row presenting a sample of the great work that the entrepreneurs are doing. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Toby Cosgrove, the CEO of Cleveland Clinic, an incredible surgeon, a friend, and without a doubt, the most batteries included physician, clinician, and CEO that I know. Dr. Cosgrove. Thank you. So, welcome to your summit. Well, it's great to be here, and nice to have you here as well. Uh, it's, great, it's great to be back, and uh, you know, we, we always have a chance to, to connect for a few minutes, and I'm, I'm in awe of the most highly registered uh, num number of attendees coming to your summit. Um, but as I've been talking to people over the last couple of days about being here, um, there's progress being made here at the clinic. Um, what would you hope everybody would get over the next couple of days, just a, a feeling of, and when they get on the plane to leave or get in the car to drive home, how do you, how do you think they should feel on Wednesday afternoon? Well, I think they ought to feel incredibly stimulated by the ideas they've been exposed to and the fact that we actually are uh, an organization that tries to push uh, the health innovations in healthcare. And, it's, and not only that, it is a great test bed for new ideas. So um, we were here two years ago. We had our last fireside chat um, during our showcase. And, um, we talked about innovation, we showed innovation. What's the biggest difference here at the clinic from two years ago? And, and I'm gonna broaden that out to both at the clinic but also healthcare overall. Well, first of all, you know, we're going through an enormous change in healthcare right now. And uh, we're now feeling the, the, the impetus to change from volume to value. We're also feeling the financial constraints that are going on across healthcare in general. And, and I think that that has been an enormous impetus for healthcare to change. We are not going to be able to deliver the quality and the volume of health care that we're going to be asked to do unless we begin to change the way we do it. And so we are looking constantly at new ways to deliver great care, even better care, uh, with fewer people involved, uh, with better technology. And frankly, we have got to depend on technology to do this. One of the pieces of data that I ran across the other day, and this absolutely shocked me, was uh, the doubling time in healthcare knowledge. By 2020, the total amount of knowledge in healthcare will double every 73 days. How on earth are we going to keep up with that without more technology, particularly AI? Are you, are you happy with the amount of progress that's been made? You know, I'm constantly unhappy. Uh, you, you constantly want to go faster and you need to do it better um, and you know we're never going to be moving as fast as we would like to move. I think that that's the sort of um, dissatisfaction with the status quo that you always have to have in order to drive an organization. 
What, what's the hardest part? What's the hardest part of kind of pushing through this? I know we, we had a chance to talk backstage a little bit about your role as CEO. I talked earlier about you know, organizations that need the right mindset, but what, what's the hardest thing on a daily basis? Well, the hardest thing I think is change. And the hardest part about change is the people involved in changing. And uh, I think on the one hand, you've got uh, patients who are now not used to having care be given to them in a different way. I mean, you stop and think about what's going to happen. The people that are going to look after you in the future, where you're going to get looked after, how you're going to get looked after, and the diseases you're going to be looked after are all going to change. Uh, and it's hard for patients to get their heads around that. It's equally difficult for the providers to get their heads around it because they have spent, in, in many cases, 20 years getting trained or getting used to or perfecting uh, what they do, and to ask them to say, look, we'd like to have you do it a different way is a major change in your mindset. And uh, we've, uh, right now, uh, we've kind of got a foot in each boat where you've got the volume boat and the value boat and the, the uh, financial incentives have not changed significantly enough to move us to the, to the value uh, equation completely. So the whole country is in the process of making this enormous change. This is the biggest change that's happened in healthcare in a century. Can you repeat that again for everybody? Because I think that's, you know, that is such a critical statement to be made by the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. Yeah, this is the biggest change I think that's happened in healthcare in a century. Uh, and uh, it is the biggest industry in the United States and it affects 100% of the people. I mean, how, how much more change could you ask for? Well, <laughs> you, you don't just sit here in, 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 in Cleveland. You, you travel the world, you have, you've had a chance to not just visit but um, uh, play in a different sandbox around um, around the world. What's different about what's happening here in the U.S. versus what's happening in different regions around the world? Well, first of all, I think the whole world is under uh, a uh, an increasing pressure um, on how you look after people with more, more things you can do for people, older populations, and the financial pressure that this massive uh, demand for health care is putting upon them. And if you look at what's going on right now, much of the world, which has been government-run health care, is now moving towards private. In the United States, we're going the opposite direction. I think what that says is that nobody's happy with the situation they've got. They're looking for something different. Um, and uh, so we see this. It's interesting in the United States, we're really worried about uh, being 18% of the GDP for healthcare costs. In Abu Dhabi, they're really worried about the fact that it's 4% of the GDP there. Um, but everybody is concerned about the growing cost of healthcare, and so everybody's looking for a different solution. Um, and uh, we are trying to figure out how we can bring more efficiency to healthcare delivery, and also at the same time, try to put more and more emphasis on keeping people well, and that really hasn't taken off yet. Is, is the, are you seeing innovation come from just within, you know, you see it externally, but do you think the clinic has, has been able to harness the power of entrepreneurs and others, or do, is, is the kind of mindset right now really develop here, and is that, how does that play with what you're doing in Abu Dhabi? Well, we see, the, the, we see innovation happening all over the world. Um, and you see it in Europe, you see it in Asia, you see it all over the United States. It's, uh, it, and the biggest issue that I have is trying to keep your finger your, on the pulse of what's going on all over the place. I, I'm constantly worried that there's some major change that's going to sneak up on me from behind I don't see coming um, and just change everything. And so I don't know how many uh, startups that there are just uh, in California, there in healthcare, there must be well over 100. Yeah. Oh, well, there's 70. We're tracking 7,500 digital health and wellness startups globally right now, and growing every day. Yeah, but I think that's the interesting part. The innovations that you see now are not the innovations that you saw 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, you saw devices and pharmaceuticals. Now you're seeing uh, all digital. How, how are you approaching it here at Cleveland Clinic? How are you approaching the filtering or the view of you know, both external and internal innovation? Well, we, you know, we are concentrating on right now on what we are trying to bring out of the Cleveland Clinic. 
Uh, we're a little overwhelmed right now with trying to manage the, all those ideas. Uh, we're constantly uh, looking for th things that would come from outside that we can participate in. I think Explorus was a great example of that, uh, which came in and uh, essentially built on the strength of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and we participated in it hard, and we're delighted to see it go on and be purchased by IBM. Um, when you think about, so if you take off your CEO hat and you put on your physician hat, which I know you wear as well, um, being a doctor today, um, coming out of med school, how, do you, how, how, how would you view the career, the choices that you need to make, the mindset that you need to be successful coming out today for young physicians and clinicians? Well, I think that one of the major things that changed is the difference between how I was trained and how uh, the reality of delivering care is now. We were trained all as individuals. And I, I laughingly tell this story about one day that I was, uh, the chief resident was leaving and leaving me in charge of the service. And he said, Toby, uh, if anything comes up that, uh, that you can't handle, handle it. Remember calling me as a sign of weakness. So, so we were essentially trained to take care of everything and without calling for help. And so when I was a general surgeon, we used to think of ourselves as we looked after the skin and its contents. Um, now, you know, it, the healthcare knowledge has gotten so great and it's so complicated, you need teams. And so teams and was not, we were not trained to be teams players and teamwork is not a natural act for doctors. So one of the things that we're doing now is we've got a new health education complex with Case Western Reserve, which is bringing together medical school, dental school, nursing school, and PA schools, and everybody will be trained together and cross-fertilized back and forth. So the first time that you meet is not going to be on the ward where everybody's an individual trained and separately in silos, but in fact, they're gonna be more like team players. Uh, and that is going to continue because there's so much knowledge and so much capabilities. You know, the average cardiac surgical patient going through the Cleveland Clinic interacts with 120 different individuals. That's a big team. And so I would say the difference now is you've got to be a team player and you've got to be ready to change with the technology as the technology changes. Always learning. Always learning. Always learning. Um, when, you, when you think about, and I'm just going to swing back to the startups and the entrepreneurs, you know, I think there's not an entrepreneur out there that wouldn't love to figure out how to commercialize and validate and partner with the Cleveland Clinic. Um, you, you've built an incredible reputation for your internal innovation. I'm coming back to this external innovation thing. How might you look at the next five years and how perhaps the Cleveland Clinic could be just fantastic partners and almost a partner of choice for entrepreneurs and startups that are really just trying to get in and be, build some validation and data to prove what they have works. Well, absolutely. What I want to do is create the, the uh, a ground where you can plant the seeds of innovation, regardless of where they come from, and see if they grow. Uh, and we have a wonderful uh, potential for this in the fact that uh, first of all, we have a big organization with lots of patients. We have a mindset about innovation that we need to continue to get better. Uh, we have multiple different locations to grow it in. One of the big opportunities we have, quite frankly, right now is Abu Dhabi. Uh, we have a American hospital run by American doctors with uh, a Cleveland Clinic mindset to it. Uh, and this is a great place for people to ch test various things uh, that are going to ultimately have to go to the FDA. So this is, and so we're seeing more and more companies come to us and say, gee, could we, instead of going to India or someplace, could we come to, to Cleveland Clinic and have that same IRB approach to looking after testing something? Do, do, you, do you feel like the organization set up for that right now here? The organization is not set up for it now, but we're working hard to set it up for it. Um, and we're bringing in new people with a new mindset about how we uh, continue to bring people in from the outside to try uh, and uh, look at new technologies. So one of the single biggest breakthroughs I mentioned to everybody uh, earlier is that uh, what we've discovered is um, it's not about the capital or the customers uh, or even just the team. It's actually about the whole mindset of everybody involved. 
Um, mindset plays such a critical role for, for entrepreneurs. Oh, no question. Talk to me a little bit about your mindset and how you think about <laughs> Uh, just a, approaching what you do every day in the face of this wave of techno technological innovation and disruption. Well, I'm, I'm thinking back about when I started as a cardiac surgeon, you know, I was constantly looking for ways that we could do something better, whether it was new instruments or new approaches or new technologies or new valves or you know, new incisions or whatever that we could. And, you know, one of the things I found that I was very good at is failing. Um, and I have a whole drawer full of things that I developed uh, that never made it out of my bottom drawer. Um, some of them uh, were ideas that happened really before people were ready for them. I, I remember one was we developed two umbrellas uh, that you could put on the end of a catheter and open on either side of it and put them together. And the company that I was working with came to me and said, well, we don't think anyone's ever going to treat the heart with a catheter. <laughs> yeah, we just, the, the time wasn't right for yeah. it. Uh, and so, but, you know, you have to keep having that mindset about, okay, how can we do it better? What is it that doesn't work? Um, and we keep, if you keep, eventually you'll find something that is, hits the, po hits the point. Do you, do you think that, that besides being almost trained and educated to not fail, um, the mindset of a clinician uh -huh. being one of which is almost the total opposite of entrepreneurial mindedness? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting thing about doctors. <clears throat> I mean, you stop and think about how we were trained. We weren't selected because we were great creative writers or uh, artists. Uh, we were uh, selected and got into medical school because we could understand how to memorize things, etc. And uh, then we went to, uh, through our medical school, just memorizing one thing after another. And then we were uh, taught uh, to do things the way the chief resident told us to do it. And then he was told how to do it by the junior attending. And he was told by the chief of whatever it was. Um, and so we became uh, not imaginative or creative, neither selected nor trained that way. Now, um, and so, and plus the fact that we were uh, learned that you didn't want to take chances with people's lives. Uh, and so it is very difficult for people to get into the entrepreneurial spirit after they ha and the, accept failure after the, you've had that sort of background. Um, so you have to understand that healthcare moves slowly. In fact, it's 13 years from the time of an idea is proven to be successful to the time it's standard of practice. Um, and so we're a very slow moving organization because I think of those two things. One, not trained for risk, not trained entrepreneurially, and two, uh, because we're dealing with patients' lives. So it's a, um, a hard road to hoe to understand that the physicians uh, are not necessarily uh, the most entrepreneurial risk takers that happened. So how do you view then, in light of that, how do you view or what would you recommend to entrepreneurs? What would be your advice to entrepreneurs today that are working daily to reimagine, transform, improve, save, create? Okay. First of all, you, you've got to find uh, a, a leader who is interested in doing this. Uh, and really leadership of an organization is vital for that, that particular thing. And, and uh, then you have to find someone within the organization uh, who is going to champion uh, that product or that device or that idea. Um, and once you get someone who has the energy and the excitement uh, and is supported with, from leadership, then I think you've got a winner. Is there a conduit to that today? And, and if you're an entrepreneur, is it, is it knock doors and try to find someone, or is there actually a path to navigating? Well, for, for, you know, one of the things that I think about the Cleveland Clinic is you stop and look at it. How is Cleveland Clinic, which is in the second poorest city in the United States, 
um, it managed to grow to the point where it has grown and it has grown only around uh, innovation and the fact that uh, we were trying to push the boundaries of whatever it was we were pushing. Um, and so the organization has a long uh, history going right from its founders and from the idea of how we're organized around a group practice of being an entrepreneurial organization and uh, also, you know, tolerating and accepting and embracing um, people with different sorts of ideas. Uh, and that, I, I think, uh, is part of uh, the organization's DNA. And I think that it is vastly important that we continue to foster that. So, uh, so the organization is ready for it. Then you have to find the individual within the organization that's going to pick up a particular project and run with it. What would you love to see the summit look like five years from now? <laughs> you know, when we started this, um, I was flabbergasted when three or four hundred people showed up the first time. And now I look out at this and I'm just saying, oh my gosh, uh, this is incredible. And, you know, I only see it, it each year it has grown. Each year it's gotten more exciting. Each year there's been more things added on to it. Uh, and we've outgrown the, the space that we were in originally and are now here. I'm looking forward to the day when we outgrow here. <laughs> pretty big space. Uh, it is pretty big space, but more crowded than ever before. Um, the Cleveland Clinic brand, brands are so important today. Credibility, believability, reputation. Um, it's often an, uh, an often overlooked part of a, a company, a business, a startup, an organization. Mm -hmm. Philosophically, what's your view on the brand? I mean, clear, clearly it was a brand when you joined 40 years ago, but today it's a completely different global brand um, that's known by so many people um, in the industry, but also patients. Philosophy? Yeah, I think one of the important things about the brand is the, the importance of transparency. Um, we are absolute believers in transparency both internally and externally. Um, one of the things we do internally is we are very transparent about what uh, the results are amongst our physicians. Uh, and frankly, we share that with them in rank order uh, by name uh, so that docs understand where they, where they stand. Then also, uh, we're transparent about the outside. Uh, we want to share our results uh, and compare them whatever we can with the benchmarks across the country. Um, I think that that um, light, if you will, is tremendous for the understanding about who we are and why we are and the fact that uh, we're not trying to hide anything. Do you, do you, feel, do you feel there's more to do? And you've done incredible work over the last 12 years as CEO. Um, what's, what's next here? Well, there's all kinds of things next. I think, uh, you know, we're in the process of uh, in expanding our global reach. Uh, we're going to London. Uh, we're expanding what we're doing here uh, in Cleveland uh, with a new cancer center due to open in uh, another three months or another six months. Um, we're uh, excited about uh, what's going on with our health education. Uh, we're opening a new hospital in uh, 21 days on the west side. Um, we are having all kinds of uh, relationships with other hospitals across the country. And in fact, I think it is important uh, that you have re uh, major partnerships uh, because we're no longer in the area where it's a cottage industry. And every industry in the United States is consolidated. I mean, if you look at airlines and look at supermarkets and bookstores and law firms and accounting firms, consulting firms, they've gotten big. And the reason they've gotten big is you've got so much support uh, for an organization, whether it's IT or HR or whatever it is, uh, that uh, to reproduce it over and over and over again and is uh, not efficient. So we, we have, we're going to get bigger. Other healthcare organizations are going to grow uh, so that there are systems. And frankly, not all hospitals should be all things to all people. Uh, the high technical things uh, that um, are done in small numbers, you've got to concentrate so you get really good at them. Um, and uh, the community services ought to be in the community. Uh, there's no reason to 
uh, to have OB not being out in the community. Um, and so we're looking at systems and I am incredibly excited about the future of the organization. I think it is a uh, better position now than it ever has been. Um, and uh, the opportunities for us are enormous. Who do you admire? Well, you know, you learn, you learn things from all kinds of different people. Um, and you learn some good things and you learn some things that you don't want to do. Um, and so I am constantly looking for the best things that I can pick from various individuals all over the place. Um, I think probably growing up uh, as I learned more about things I didn't want to do and the things I didn't want to practice, but I've always gone places to try and learn things from other people. So you admire the way somebody does something and you admire the way somebody else does something and you try to bring them together and uh, in both in your organization and yourself personally. All right, so who do you admire? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think one thing we have to say is this gentleman that, that's about to come talk to us, I think you have to say you admire him enormously and the energy that he has brought uh, to uh, the Cancer Moonshot. Um, it is only through force of his office and personal energy that uh, he's gotten as far as, brought us as far as we have, and I think you have to take your hat off to him. It's an enormous uh, contribution. So that's a, a great lead into uh, to Vice President Biden, who's, who's about to come on stage and, and give the keynote. Um, why do you think now is the right time for his moonshot, the moonshot, and why and we're going to hear from him, but I want to know, you know, you've, you've, been, you've, you've been with him in, in a couple of different places over the last year, um, watched him deliver the keynote, you've spent time with him personally. Tell me why you think now. Well, I think now what we're seeing is a tremendous uh, series of things that are coming together that are going to help us. First of all, um, big data, enormous opportunity. Uh, the uh, ability to uh, communicate as well as we have through all the devices and social media and um, uh, in internet, enormous. The explosion that's happening in genomics. <clears throat> uh, the understanding increasingly of the causes and the prevention and the, uh, that are all coming together. I think there, this is a wonderful time for uh, medicine in general, and uh, certainly these uh, forces that are going to expedite uh, all of our cures. I mean, when I go back to the fact that the total amount of knowledge is doubling every 73 days, you know, we've got to have new ways to, to handle that data, and now's our opportunity, and now we can begin to apply it to cancer. Um, do you believe? Do you believe that we can end cancer as we know it? I think we're going to, we're, we're seeing more and more cancer now uh, being turned into a chronic disease. Um, and some cancers are, um, are curable, no question about that. Bigger percentage all the time. Do I think we will totally end it in most of our lifetimes? No, I don't think so. Uh, but I think it will change in the, from being a death sentence, if you will, to something that is manageable and treatable and turned in many cases into a chronic disease. Um, Vice President Biden's coming out to talk to us and, and you, you've, you've heard him say so many times how um, the passion and the moment and the energy that we need to harness globally is, is so important. Um, what for you is the most important part of where you sit today, the legacy you want to leave, and the, the feeling you want to leave people with about Toby Cosgrove? You know, I don't, I don't think about my legacy at all. Seriously, I don't. I, I, talk about, I think about the organization. Um, I say this and often, and I absolutely mean it. Um, the Cleveland Clinic made me. I did not make the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm very, very uh, fortunate to have the opportunity that I had to be here and to participate uh, the way I have been. Well, Dr. Cosgrove, four years ago, a little over four years ago, when we first met in Washington. Yeah, um, remember you, it well. You invited um, just a little over a dozen of our companies 
to Cleveland Clinic. And as we've grown each year, I can't tell you how much we've appreciated the red carpet being rolled out. The chance to launch your summit every year is one of the highlights of our year. Um, our, our friendship um, with you and your wife and the way all of the leaders here at the clinic have embraced entrepreneurs is, is really a model to be followed. We look forward to doing more work together and more importantly, coming back a year from now, not just with more progress, but a defined way that entrepreneurs and startups can really bring their solutions here and we can work together to change healthcare. Um, as I say, always batteries included. Uh, Dr. Cosgrove, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for letting me sit down with you today. Thank you, Hart. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. So, um, there's going to be a little bit, of, a little bit of a set change here. I think that you're going to see a little logo go up there for the vice president. Um, it's going to be a few minutes, but I want to once again thank you all for giving us a chance to inspire, to hopefully connect, link arms. And if I leave you with one thing today, it's the notion of be batteries included. Remember, a meeting, a talk, a conversation can lead and help entrepreneurs in ways you can't even begin to imagine. Ladies and gentlemen, please give the health transformers another round of applause. Do Dr. Toby Cosgrove, Susan, and the great team at Cleveland Clinic Innovations for putting this wonderful event together. And we will be right back. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful summit. And I look forward to meeting you in the next couple of days. Take care.